Hi, I'm Jeff Brown. Hi, I'm Ross Bentley. And this is this, no, no Dumb Questions. Dumb question. <laughs> we'll get our timing right. We, we it's, it's I don't know how do how do those guys do that? I don't know, do but do? um well, they probably have like professor professional engineers, audio engineers doing trick stuff, I'm pretty sure. Right, right. And they might be sitting next to each other and they can elbow each other in the ribs to go at the same time or something. Or maybe you know what? Here's what I think it is. They have talent. Oh, we don't. <laughs> yeah. When has that ever stopped either one of us? Yeah, <laughs> true, true. Yeah. yeah. And actually, what we're referring to is if you haven't listened to there's a there's a podcast called No Stupid Question, and uh, it's a great uh, non motorsport podcast. And that's how we kind of got the inspiration for doing this, this podcast, this series of podcasts called No Dumb Questions. So, um, Jeff, do we have any dumb questions? Uh, no, there are none. We have lots of questions, but by definition, none of them are dumb. Okay, so then I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a question, and you can give us okay. a dumb answer. <clears throat> that I do. I'm, we have lots of dumb answers. Okay, so so Jeff Nathan asked the question: Would you rather work with a driver with no technical background who just gets in and drives and doesn't argue with setup, or would you rather work with a driver who has a technical background and can provide more detailed feedback? but is also driver seat quarterbacking the changes and second guessing set up con- constantly. Whew. Okay. Well, I I'm going to I'm going to I need to ask Nathan a question unfortunately he's not here. Which one of those guys is faster? Cuz I'll take that guy. I thought you were going to say which one are you, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be two. That could be two. I'll take the fastest guy. One of them is going to be harder work than the other one, but I'll, I'll, I just want to go faster. And that's the short answer and kind of the, the funny, silly answer. But it's not so silly. There's a lot of people will put up with drivers who are quirky and weird and all sorts of things. As long as you're fast, it makes up for a lot of personality deficiencies and a lot of other, a lot of other problems. But you could say that the right driver who can give good feedback to his engineer and his team will be faster because he can come up with a faster car than a guy who can't give good feedback. So I'm not sure it's an, it's an either, or I've had drivers who were seat of the pants guys. Jimmy Kite is a guy, probably not many people have heard of, but I ran him at Indy. Fantastic. Just unbelievably good at car feel and feeling the edge and as it turned out going over the edge quite a bit to find where that edge was but i mean he would i mean we're at indy and he's going whatever 230 miles an hour and he comes in and how is it he goes well i don't know i just i gotta drive it off the right rear tire more and i'm like drive it off the right rear tire we're not at you know wherever at Syracuse on a mile oval or something here we're we're at Indy he goes yeah I gotta feel the right rear tire I gotta feel what it's doing and I said well how's it handling understeer oversteer you know how's the aero balance where's the center of pressure he goes I need to feel the right rear tire and I'm like so what does that mean he goes well I can't feel it I said like make it looser he goes yeah let's let's slide the right rear tire and then I'll be able to tell you so there's drivers and he was incredibly fast so there's drivers like that that just have that innate feel and can't relate it directly back to the engineer as much. And then there's drivers that maybe are too, uh, I don't know, engineering educated. And they're, they think their job to come in and give you like a full, like you don't need a data system. Well, my brake trace looked like this and my throttle pedal had this little blip because the car you know, the, the the heave amplitude on the bump in turn six was too much. And then, you know, I, I don't think the acceleration dampened out quick enough. So we were continuing to have that oscillation all the way into the turn in point where it was too much load on the front axle. It didn't transfer enough weight to the to the rear axle quick enough. It transferred enough, but the timing was off. And your the engineer's mind just explodes because you can't take all that feedback. You want him just to say, I want to drive it off the right rear tire. <laughs> it's much easier. So uh, I don't know if I if it's an either or for me. Um, I will say kind of the middle ground are where the the true fast pros live. 
they can they can drive it just to get the feel for it and relate that feel. We talked in the previous episode about just relating the feel of the car. Don't try to get too technical. They can relate that feel back without all of the engineering stuff. So I think I think maybe maybe the middle ground, and I would also say, I know you're big on this, the ability for a driver to change gears on those, depending on the circumstances, is important. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, sort of going back a ways, but to a four-time Indianapolis 500 winner, Rick Mears. I mean, there was a guy who, you know, his feedback, his detail, his tuning of the car, I mean, the guy was absolutely brilliant. But there come up, you know, like he was a guy that in the 500, he could be running in 10th place early in the race. And you go, Mears has still got a shot at winning this thing. And, and you know, as the race would go, you know, they keep making little subtle changes during pit stops. And all of a sudden, in the last 25 miles, he's there. He's in the top two or three. And he's there. And he's got a shot at it. And, you know, I remember the year that he he I guess that was uh, I'm trying to think of when that was 91 or something like that when I think it was his last win um and Michael Andretti was leading and Michael Andretti made this big pass on on Mears and you go Andretti's got this thing and no. Mears comes back with a pass on the outside in turn one and just went take that kid and you're yeah. going that that was like screw the setup I'm just going to drive the wheels off this thing and it's like man that was magic so uh, exactly I, I love seeing a driver that can make that switch. I mean, you know, obviously your kid Colin, I mean, one of the things I, you know, obviously you've seen a lot of it. I've seen a lot of it as well Is you know, Colin's so good at that setup and giving the feedback and tuning the car. And then it comes to you know, his qualifying lap at most port a couple of years ago. It was just like, screw the setup. We're just going right. to drive the wheels off this thing to the point where I'm like, Holy crap! Stop that, Colin. You're scaring me here. So, <laughs> yeah, and that's because um, that's because he had me as his engineer, and the setup was horrible. So he's learned <laughs> to drive horrible setups over the years. It's, yeah, yeah, it's that kind of a it's that kind of a thing. You know, you talk about mirrors. I think in that same kind of era, uh, Al Senior was that same kind of guy. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. Well, I just read. Uh, I'll give a plug for a book here, but the the Al Junior book that just came out, kind of his. Yeah. I just finished that. Jade Gross wrote it and it was, uh, I mean, did it with Al Jr. And he talked up, Al Jr. talked about his dad being so good at that. Like he would just hang around in tents and just kind of, and then suddenly, boom, he wins Indy four times. It's like, how did he do that? He's never spectacular. And, and, but he could just, he could just drive the car. And, and that's maybe lost. That ability is maybe lost on some of the younger guys coming along because it's always about get the setup understand the data look at the details of the data work with your engineer from a very young age go-kart guys now kids they have mechanics and engineers and they're looking at data all the time and i'm not saying that's bad but maybe they lose a little bit of that just drive the car kind of thing and so you know nathan asked i think I, my heart really likes that just drive the car kind of guy my my results like the just drive the car when you have to but give good feedback on how it feels now don't tell me what to change tell me how it feels and let's talk about what i might be able to change to make it feel better for you I think that guy's the the that's the world class guys that's where they live so you know i think that there's a you brought up the point of younger drivers and they look at the data and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, sometimes I, I kind of go, can you imagine AJ Foyt, Mario Andretti, Bobby Unser standing around looking at data traces? <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah. Okay. Hold that thought for a second. That happened to me. I'm at Indy 94, I think 94. I have Johnny Parsons as my driver. Yep. And so Johnny's one of those era guys, you know, back back in the thing. And I was hired, I was race engineer and we're running around at Indy. And Johnny really, he was hired last minute kind of thing. He hadn't been with the team and just like, okay, we need a guy who's got lots of experience. Let's plop him in there. We plop Johnny Parsons in there. And he goes around and 
and I pull up the data, of course, because I'm going to analyze his data and see where we can make the car better. And Johnny's getting out of the car. We're in the garage area. And, and I say, wow. He, he said something like, yo, eh, that's it. Flat all the way around. It's just got too much downforce or whatever. We, it's flat all the way around. We got to trim this thing out. I'm like, yeah. hmm. well, you're lifting in turn one. And he's like, you can't hear that from the middle of pit lane. And I'm like, no, no, I can see it here on the data. And he comes up and he looks at my dot matrix printout or whatever I had back then. And he goes, what's that? And I said, that's the throttle trace. And he goes, you're measuring that on my car? And I said, yeah, we're measuring that on your car. And he's like, you can look at that? And I said, yeah. He goes, I'm not flat, am I? I said, no. He goes, well, this sucks. Now, now you see everything I do. Now I can't tell you. This is terrible. And he, he, he started spiraling down about this is the death knell of motorsports. And this is going to ruin it and everything else. And a little bit in jest, but there was some, there was some truth to it, too. He, he didn't like it. Well, and, and I think it brings, uh, you know, it, it brings up a point of there are a lot of drivers now that how do I put this so I don't sound like the old fuddy dud that I that I am, right. <laughs> but but you you know they they go fast by following the data. It's it's like well the data you know another driver did this. Well, go and copy their data. Like essentially do what that other driver. Nobody ever told AJ Foyt to go and stand in the throttle like Mario did, or vice versa. Right. They figured right. it out on their own, and and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing that, but I still think that the very, 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 very best drivers. I mean, a guy like Verstappen. I mean, I've read and heard him in interviews say that he doesn't look at data that much. You know, and and you can tell by the way he drives. It's just it's raw feel, and yep. and and I think, you know, I, I don't think. I mean, I know Hamilton looks at data, but I don't think that Hamilton's that last tiny little bit that gives him the edge over Botas or every other co-driver that he or teammate that he's had. It doesn't come from him spending more time looking at the data. It comes from that last little bit, and I think data has brought all the drivers closer together. And, you know, back in the Mario, AJ, Johnny Parsons day kind of thing, uh, Alan's or senior kind of days, you know, I think the difference between the very best and the less than best was bigger because yep. they didn't, the, the, the less than best didn't have the data that brought them a lot closer. Yep. I, I agree. It's, it's certainly, I'm with you. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm an engineer. I'm, I use data. I do that, but there's, a lot of times when you just got to drive the car and give the good, give the good feedback um, of the feel of the car, not the, not the data. I've, you know, Nathan asked about the, the driver seat quarterbacking. I've, that I can say never works. <laughs> that is always a disaster. The no technical background just drive gets in and drives the, you know, what out of it. That, sometimes works but that guy will always get beat by a guy of equal talent who does work with the engineer and get it out of it you know it's you know, think of think of senna always comes to mind there's a guy who is as naturally talented and could feel a car as good as arguably anybody ever and he worked on the data harder than anybody ever yeah. ever and what do you get you get him you get schumacher you get People like that. You get Hamilton. You get people like that because they have the natural talent. That by itself isn't going to get it at the highest level. The super data geek who can't drive and feel a car isn't going to get it either. But boy, if you can, the, on the rare cases that those two come together, there's your world champions. So, so it just reminds me like a funny story of uh, in what year was that? That was 97, 1997. I was driving a world sports car in IMSA. Um, and it was a Riley and Scott. Um, I was probably racing against you guys in the Ferrari 333 or something that year, I think. And yeah. uh, uh, at Daytona for the 24 hour race, the team owner hired Danny Sullivan, spin and win Danny from, you know, Indy 500 winner. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, First, you know, he goes out and runs. I get in the car and I go out and do my laps. I come back in 
and I'm talking to the engineer and Danny and I look at him and I said, you know, I just feel like, like the front end kind of, you know, I come into the corner and I, as I'm coming off the brakes, like the front end just kind of unloads. Like, I don't know, like it, like it needs more front damping to hold like more rebound to hold it down or something like that. And he kind of looks at me and goes, look, I don't know the difference between a damper and a spark plug. So don't talk to me about any of this stuff and kind of really? walk away. I'm like, really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was, it was, now the guy could drive, right? But, yeah. You know, there was a guy that, that he won and he won championships and all that kind of stuff, but he didn't do it by being the most technically brilliant guy, but he right. could drive a car. Um, Absolutely. And the other thing is, and the last thing, and maybe we'll move on after this, but you touched on this of personalities. Mm -hmm. And and Jeff, I've heard you talk about certain drivers. You go, if that driver is on that team, I will not be working for that team. <laughs> I've, yeah, we're not, not going to name name here. But I mean, no. Danny Sullivan, nobody ever said he's got a bad personality. Get him out of the team. Right. So right. he, and I, maybe he, he made up for his lack of technical knowledge by a great personality and he could drive. I mean, the, the thing is, drivers, it's hard to get a drive, obviously. We've, we, we know that. It's hard to get a drive. Why would you want to alienate your engineer, your crew chief, your owner, your sponsor, or anything by just being bad personality-wise? And so those guys, um, it, it's funny. The maybe one or two guys that I've said that about that I'm like, Hey, I'm not going to work with that guy again. It never really became a problem because he never had a ride on a team that I could go to work for because he just evaporated. You know, it's yeah. just, it's, it's that, it's that team kind of player thing that you have to have. And Sullivan, I mean, the results were there. Yeah, I don't care how you do it it's by spinning out and winning Indy or not. Win, I, you win Indy, I'm impressed. I mean, that is that's, that's all I need to know. Yeah. And the fact uh, I, I I hadn't heard you tell me that story before. The fact that you said that is kind of cool, right? I mean, you you'd like to have a guy who can just drive the wheels off of it. We've both worked with drivers like that. Like I said, Jimmy Kite, who could do that, and it's just like, yeah, raw talent. That's so fun to see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So why don't we list off the names of all the people, all the drivers that have bad personalities? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think so because we're going to get the, the next thing will be drivers listing names of coaches and engineers that have bad personalities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 No. All right. Let me ask you a question then. Okay. Um, this is from, it's from Instagram, it looks like, and it's uh, the guy's, the handle name is Alex Gold 79 So Alex, I'm going to assume first name. Um, he says, he's obviously a driver, and he says, I have a hard time wrapping my head around outbreaking someone in a turn. If car A is break, sounds like there's math involved, car A. Uh -oh. If car A is breaking as late as possible, how does car B, quote, outbreak them car b starts breaking later and trail breaks into the corner is that the most common scenario ross in your no dumb questions podcast can you cover how to outbreak someone into a corner or more or more generally how to pass in a corner that's wow. a good question let me answer the first you can okay. outbreaking someone is easy but also making the corner at the end of it that's where it gets tricky. Well, that's why like every corner is a flat and fifth gear corner. Right. On the entry. On the entry. Right. <laughs> right. No, that's a good question by Alex. And I, I want to hear, I want to hear what you, what you think here. How but do you is, outbreak a guy? So, so what, this is one of those uh, situations where podcasts suck because this is all audio and I would love to be able to demonstrate and show and all that kind of stuff, which we can't do here, but um you know, it's similar. I, I had somebody else ask me this question recently because it was it was after the Brazilian Grand Prix when when Lewis Hamilton was trying to was attempting the pass around the outside of her for stopping in that corner, and he was kind of like, "Well, how could somebody ever pass on the outside?" And so they're similar here. First of all, I let, I guess what we're going to assume here is we've got two cars of equal uh, performance yep. because. You know, if, if one car 
has better brakes or more aero or more tire or whatever, more right. grip, that's that's a no-brainer, right? Um, right. So uh, the, the simple thing, I guess, or the first thing is, let, let's assume that, uh, let's see, I'm looking at, at the question here. Um, let's assume that car A is braking on the regular line. Okay. And car B is going to try to outbreak them by moving to the inside. Um, the, the thing, the point of this, the, uh, of the big thing here of setting up this pass is you actually don't need to pass that car in a brake zone. And it's a mistake actually a lot of drivers make, I think, is they think, oh, I'm going to actually pass that car in a brake zone. No, all you need to do is get to the turn in point around the turn in point close to equal to that car on the outside. So you don't need to get past them. In fact, if you get past them, you've opened up the opportunity for them to come back and kind of do that undercut and come back and pass you on the exit. So all you want to do is just get up beside them. And, and you know, even if you only get your nose of your car with the front wheel of that car that's on the outside, uh, that's all, that's as far as you really need to go. Because now you're in a position where that driver on the outside can't do anything. And in fact, now you control that corner. So it's not like you have to go way past that other car. Um, so then it comes down to, you know, well, still, if, you know, if you're behind the car when it gets to the braking point, and let's assume that the pass didn't start on the straightaway. Obviously, if car B that was following got a bit of a draft and was able to uh, begin the pass on the straightaway, now they've got more speed. And that's kind of what, if you go back to that Brazilian Grand Prix, if you watch that Hamilton head DRS was coming down the outside because Verstappen moved the inside to block that. Um, he probably had 10 miles an hour more top speed. So the pass actually began approaching the brake zone. But let's, let's say that they're actually equal. And let's say that car A always breaks at the, at the five marker for this corner. And car B always breaks at the five marker for this corner. Car B's job, the driver of that car, all they really need to do is get half a car length past the five marker. And, you know, think about that. What's what's the average length of a car? Yeah, you know, you may be looking at uh, six feet, eight yeah. feet, something like that. So even if you just take that six feet and go, okay, so if I, if, if, Everything else is exactly the same. Both drivers braked exactly the same way, but car B braked six feet later. If you got to the if you got to the turn in point and you turned in six feet later, but <laughs> car A is on the outside, guess who's going to take that corner? Car B. Right. Yeah, it's about positioning, isn't it? It's really it's 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 position more than beating them. Like like nobody, I, I like your theory. You don't really pass before the corner. You don't outbreak a guy and then pull back in in front of him and take the normal line. That never happens. Not, you, not in anything equal, like no. anything remotely equal. <laughs> right, right. You beat him to the apex. And and maybe at an extreme sacrifice of your mid-corner speed too, right? It doesn't really matter as long as you beat him. Absolutely. In fact, at that point in time, you could slow down to one mile an hour. If that, if car A is on the outside of you, guess what speed they're going to be at? Right. Now, some will say, but yeah, but that driver could drive around the outside. And there are cases where you could have a driver that's, I'm going to say, a little bit brave and, and in the right situation could, uh, I guess, fight that pass and continue around the outside and you see that every now and then you see that in IndyCar racing uh man it just immediately popped to mind Alexander Rossi and Takuma Sato at, at Road America a couple of years ago where they went side by side through a couple of corners together and you know neither one of them is going to give up so you can get there you can have those situations where another driver says you're not going to take that line away from me I'm going to stay on the outside of you and if you have two drivers that respect each other and you go through there and maybe they touch a little bit, maybe they don't, but they come out of the corner and you, the fans go, Ooh, great stuff. Give me more of that. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but, 
but yeah, the, the the point is you don't need to pass anybody in, a, in the break zone. And I think, you know, again, that's the biggest mistake. The, the, actually, the two biggest mistakes in the break zone are uh, a driver trying to get too far past. Again, you know, they're rather than just getting up equal with that car on the outside, they want to get to the point where they've cleared that car. And again, that mm-hmm. opens up the opportunity for that driver to come back because that driver is probably going to go six feet late or be a little slow to get the car turned and they're on a tighter line. So the car on the outside actually has an advantage then. So only ever get up side by side. The second mistake is a lot of drivers will move too far to the inside. And, you know, I call this presenting yourself. You know, you you, you want to get in a position where the driver on the outside can see you. And if you've moved, if you've moved like, three car lengths or three car widths to the inside, the driver on the outside can't even see you at that point, And they're more likely to turn in and hit you. Plus when they hit you, they're going to have a whole lot more momentum. Plus, if, you're, momentum. If, if you're one inch away from that car on the outside and he turns in and hits you, yeah, you're barely going to feel it. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so I have one, I, I have I, I, that whole, that moving to the inside thing. Yeah. I, you know, I, uh, that makes all makes perfect sense. What my mind went to some cases that I've seen, it's like anything else where the, the exception proves the rule or whatever they say. <clears throat> I've seen where, and it's some particular tracks, but two pop to my mind. One's a go-kart track in Indiana and South Bend, which is unrelated to anything that most people are going to drive. The other one, let's take Cleveland, the old Cleveland mm. uh, IndyCar track. Going into turn one, You can actually, now that's an extreme case, but I've seen drivers where you can't outbreak the guy. You can't even get up alongside of him. But if you pull enough to the inside, the perspective for the driver on the outside is so weird that you look like you're ahead of him. And he's like, oh man, the guy outbroke me. And in fact, you didn't because you're so far, because the driver on the outside like, wow, he's at the apex already. Dang it, I got beat. And and he's actually behind you, but he's kind of at the apex. But the guy on the outside has a lot longer to go to get to the apex. So you can actually like I've seen drivers trick other drivers to thinking they've gotten outbreak by going far to the inside. Again, exception to what you're saying. Normally, well, that's not the case. Yeah, no. And, and, you know, another place that that you can get away with that is at Coda. Uh into turn one a little bit and yep. especially into turn 11, the hairpin, the far end, the entry to those corners are so wide that there are times, and you know, this is not a, this is not a tactic that I would use on the second lap of a race where you've got another stint and a half to go or, you know, right. whatever. But if I was come down to the last lap and I was like six car lengths back, <laughs> I might just stove it into the inside and basically drive it in on an angle for the apex and just stove it into the apex and just try to get to the apex before the other driver and hope that that driver turns in and just gets to the apex when you're going through the apex 10 miles an hour slower than they are. And they've kind of got a, you've taken all their momentum away and right. now you come out of there the right way. If that driver on the outside is smart, they're going to kind of drive around you. Um, they're going to see that and they're going to adjust to it, but sometimes they don't. And sometimes it's just, you know, uh, to your point is passing is more about positioning than it is about who's in the lead. Right. Right. No, that makes sense. You see that you see people doing what you just described there. Um, at Coda, you see people try that into 10 a at road Atlanta and get it wrong horribly <laughs> time after time after time. Yes. Because it just, you end up in the gravel trap. I can't, I mean, this last Petit Le Mans, we must have had that happen five times in, yeah. in a 10 hour race. Well, in the, the other thing is, is in, you know, I, I, I grew up around short track oval racing, super modified sprint cars from the time I was five years old. And, you know, I was, you know, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but like at nine years old, I could sit in the grandstand and I could go watch that red number 33. It's in 12th place right now, but watch. And I would basically study these drivers setting up passes. And the great thing about 
racing on an oval is that, you know, a road course, you kind of make an attempt on a pass and it works or it doesn't work. Oval right. track, you set up a pass and you work that pass lap after lap after lap after lap. And it might be like, I'm going to pass this driver 15 laps from now, but I'm going to start it now. And, right. And, you know, Colin learned all that stuff in NASCAR, right? And, and it's yep. just, it's in, if you want to be a really great road racer, uh, go and study short track oval racing. Man, I, I, Colin's one, and I'm sure others have said it too, but he's one who said that that short track oval racing, Martinsville, Bristol, you know, Martinsville is the prime example, helped him a lot when he went back road racing again. Was you know, he he's like, uh, whatever, he'd have Ron Hornaday on his bumper for 40 laps. Yeah. What was Hornaday doing? Trying to pass him for 40 laps, trying to make the same move work for 40 laps. And it, like you said, yeah, that, that it would end and Hornaday would go, yeah, I was going to pass you and I was going to pass you 40 laps ago. You just didn't know it yet, but you were going to be passed, <laughs> you know, and yeah. that's the way, it, that's the way it works. And there's, those guys are, those guys are so good at that. That's, that's why it's fun to watch those cars on, on short tracks, you know, uh, Martinsville, uh, I wish they had more of those short half miles. Yeah. And, and, you know, people say, ask me, I mean, what's your favorite race? And, and that I've ever run. And one of them was on the Milwaukee Oval in an Indy car. And oh, yeah. 28 cars, 28 Indy cars on a one mile oval, Milwaukee, which is pretty flat, like no, not a lot of banking. No. And, you know, at any moment in time, you're running in, you know, I was in a not the most competitive car. And let's say I'm running, I'm running 18th and I'm battling with a guy in 17th and 19th. We're being lapped by first, second, and third, and we're also, uh, the, uh, you know, there's another pack of, of you know, ninth, tenth, and eleventh, and the twenty seventh, twenty eighth cars. We're passing them, and there's all of that stuff happening all at the same time, and you're trying to keep track of all of these different cars, and that's why, if truly, if you want to be the best road racer with your racecraft. Watch oval racing, study it. And, you know, you've talked about this before. I think you talked about it in a previous um, podcast, um, how you watch races. You watch it from the perspective of, of an engineer and strategist. You yep. know, I watch it from the perspective <laughs> of, you know, is that driver sitting that pass up now? You know, rarely, rarely does a driver make a pass where I go, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, right. You know, right. I, you I, I think Verstappen – passing Hamilton on that first or making that attempt on the, on the very first lap of the last Grand Prix at Abu Dhabi, you know, him stoving it in there. It was, there was a moment that was like, Whoa. And, you know, like I was like, is he going to make that? Um, but, you know, w watch racing with, uh, with a strategy, uh, you, yep. a, a learning strategy, you know, whether That's it's, race strategy, whether it's set up, whether it's like, wow, look at the line that driver is driving, whether it's like how they set that pass up. I think that's a, that's why you should be watching races. Yeah, there's entertainment, but. Right. Well, I mean, and that brings it full circle to Alex's question. There's watch those races and holy smokes, you'll see how other drivers outbreak guys without really passing them. Like you said, before the corner, there's some, it, it's, 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 pretty interesting to see how two pretty equal cars can you can beat the other guy and some of it like you said some of it's maybe a little draft and you pop out but that only gets you kind of like halfway alongside of them and then but it's positioning it's all positioning yeah and yeah so you ask you know how to pass in a corner watch races and there you go you can learn as much from the <laughs> the mistakes as you can from the, from the, from the passes that worked. And, yep. and, and honestly, uh, I think watching indie cars is probably the best you can do right now. You know, I love IMSA sports car racing, but a lot of passes happen because, well, that car is a little faster in a straight line versus that one's a little quicker in the corners. There are differences in cars. So the drivers are taking advantage of that. And that's really important, especially if you race in endurance racing at all. But 
you know, and in Formula One, you can't tell me that, you know, the Alfa Romeos are as good as a Mercedes is. Um, right, right. But in IndyCar racing, all those cars are pretty darn close. And from one weekend to the next, you get cars that are really close. And you see guys going wheel to wheel and setting up passes and making passes. And, and wow, there's some great stuff there. I agree. IndyCar, it's, it's essentially a spec series. I'll add one more for me. The other thing that I would watch is go to an IMSA race and watch the MX-5 Cup races. Oh, oh. I mean, <laughs> those, <better. laughs> are, those are like the best. I mean, we go to the IMSA races. We shut down. I schedule my driver briefing, pre-race driver briefings around the MX-5 Cup. So we all sit in the office and watch the MX-5 races. I mean, that's like the that's as good as it gets from all of that driving standpoint, outbreaking, positioning standpoint. I mean, those are great. Date date or uh, the Daytona MX five race this year. What was that? Five cars abreast at the finish. Yeah. Sebring, I think, was three or four. That last yep. lap at, at Road America or Road Atlanta at the Petit Le Mans weekend. Yep. They're coming down yeah. the hill and they're crossed up, and it's like, yeah, what? <laughs> yeah. All the the you know the IMSA the, the WeatherTech series paddock. I mean, they're all cheering and <laughs> watching this right. stuff. Like right. the great whole stuff. the whole WeatherTech paddock shuts down for the MX five race. It's like. Huh. Okay, we're not going to schedule drivers' meetings. We're not going to do autographs. We're not going to do the driver change practice. We were just time out. It's like uh, I don't know, like it's it's like Italy in August. It just shuts down. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, okay, that was good. That was yeah. Good. Okay, great stuff. Uh, neither one of those questions were dumb, Jeff. No, um, and the, our, but those were our dumb answers to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. There we go. Uh, let's wrap this one up uh, again. Thanks. Uh, if you've got questions, Jeff, send them to you at uh, Mesa Vista Coffee. And that's on Instagram for me. And at Ross Bentley on Instagram or Speed Secrets on Facebook. Send us your questions and maybe we'll be dumb enough to answer them. Uh, we can do that for sure. And in the meantime, have fun. Watch races and have fun. Watch races. Have fun. <laughs>